Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Advise Health's presentation, Perspectives on Health Plan Overpayments. The presentation you're about to view took place during Broad and Cassell's third annual Orlando Healthcare Forum on April 21st, 2017. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on Advise Health. At Advise Health, we analyze processes, implement solutions, and deliver quality educational opportunities to entities of all sizes. Advise has been in existence for over 14 years and employs the industry's top auditing and consulting experts. We offer an extensive catalog of services, including litigation support, HIPAA and compliance analysis, medical record auditing, and educational services for the healthcare industry. The seminar you're about to view is just one of many services that Advise Health advisory sector has to offer. After this brief pause, the presentation will begin. Exciting. This is an opportunity that we have been talking about for a while, and thank you, Gordon Chappelle, for allowing us to do this. We had Michelle fly in from New York City just to be with us here today, and we thank you all for being here with us live. This is a topic that we had been discussing for a while at Advise Health. I'm actually going to go through my intro right now so you understand a little more about why this topic means so much to us. We are almost 15 years old at this point at Advice Health, and our original book of business was working for insurance companies providing audits around fraud, waste, and abuse. Over the years, we also built out an advisory practice where we started helping providers from a proactive perspective, more around compliance. I had a number of my clients ask me, who are you trying to get the money for? Is it us or them? I said, well, we truly sit on the fence of CMS, which is right is right. No undercoding, no overcoding, just what is correct. So that is what our firm focuses on. Now, I have friends on both sides. I have friends that represent the providers, and I have friends that represent the payers. Who's my favorite? We love them all because we want correct coding and billing. So we are happy to discuss this with you today. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mike Bittman. I am a provider lawyer, only 35 years in practice. <laughs> I'm Michelle Dry Campbell, and um, I have always represented health insurers or plans. Um, in my background, actually, it was primarily commercial litigation. And then about um, after 1994, I had the actual good luck to get a job at the in-house legal department of Metropolitan Life. At that time, MetLife did a lot of health insurance. Um, so I started working on health uh, healthcare fraud cases. I learned about that elusive thing called ERISA. Um, it was a great experience. And I have to give a shout out, speaking of ERISA, because my boss at MetLife, and who now is up counsel at my firm, um, is here to celebrate his 50th high school reunion at Winter Park. <laughs> so, thank you, Jim. Um, and so, it, so I learned about uh, Fraud and ERISA and life and health insurance litigation at MetLife, and then started my own firm uh, about 20 years ago. And since then, we've been doing, again, life, health, and disability insurance with a very large emphasis on fraud, including life insurance fraud, disability fraud, um, mortgage fraud, uh, you know, fake death claims, and things like that. And I'm so thrilled to be here. And, you know, and I met Jean Marie last, last year at the Eastern Claims Conference. And for the last year, yeah, last year, and we've been in touch ever since and, and really hoping to be able to have an opportunity to be here. Thank you. And thank you, of course, Mike. Thank you. So today we are going to go through the entire investigation, again, from the provider and the payer perspective. I had a friend from LexisNexis tell me, who are you in healthcare? Are you the patient? or the provider? Are you actually helping the patient feel better? If you aren't one of those, you're a peripheral. And I didn't like that at all. I said, what do you mean? Am I just costing healthcare more? That's not okay. So the three of us, what we do share in common and what all sides share in common when looking at an investigation is trying to reduce the cost and make the delivery of healthcare better. So that's what we're going to go over today. 
some of the tools that insurance companies look for, some of the payers look for, whether it be CMS for an investigation or a private payer, the, the tools that they use, data. The story mostly starts with data, data mining. We have clients that will take data, and how do they even get the data? That's always an issue. I have some of my clients that take four weeks for them to be able to pull the data. By that time, do you realize how many claims could go in that are incorrect? So it's always a time schedule that we're looking at. But they will pull down the data. Some of them in-house use Excel. They use Access. There are different tools that you have right on your desktop that you can use to analyze data. And some of our clients do that. Other of our clients, others, will go out externally and hire companies such as Healthcare Fraud Shield to perform extensive data analytics where flags are coming in daily, a real time saying, okay, this might be a fraudulent case. Maybe this is an area of abuse. At the data level with data mining and predictive modeling, you're able to determine, hmm, maybe I should look at this provider. Why is this provider seeing 500 patients a day? That might be an issue. Where are the location? Where is this happening? Where are the visits happening? So you're able to really dig into different areas within the data that you then want to take a look at in a little more depth. When we are looking at data ourselves here at Advise, we use RATSTAT, which is an OIG free statistical tool, always holds up in court for the most part. And uh, it is something that payers, providers, they're familiar with. This is a great tool. If you don't know about it, I recommend you go out and look at it. We will typically perform a statistically valid random sample. If we're going to perform extrapolation, we'll get into this a little bit more. But early on, we do use RASTAS to help us support additional review. And then when it comes to looking at the flags, knowing if the flags are actionable, we get more into audits. And there are good tools out there for a quick and dirty audits. For instance, the EM Calculator, and we will be posting this on our website. The EM Calculator is a good free tool for you to use if you're just taking a basic look. Another way that plans learn about uh, so, some providers to look at is they get calls. They get calls from the uh, patients, the participants, and they get a call because they've received an EOB, explanation of benefit form, and they say, I didn't get this service. I didn't get this treatment. Sometimes it's, I don't even know who this doctor is. And so as a result of that, the plans start looking into, some, into what's going on. Um, before computers, they would have to go through the documents hand, you know, by hand. And in one case, I remember, uh, the issue was that someone had called, and also at the same time, uh, the uh, doctor had, was being in, uh, investigated for fraud by the uh, Fed. And they went through the documents, and they saw that Oftentimes, for one patient, he had built 10 eye surgeries. So that's something that was probably, would probably be easily picked up now, but back then it wasn't. So that was actually, I have to tell you, the first big case I worked on. Um, it was very rewarding because we had some serious money, but uh, interesting case. And uh, so that's the other way, too, is when someone's arrested, when a provider's arrested, that's very helpful for a health insurer plan because the government has really, really good subpoena powers, and they can get a lot of information. And I remember that one of my clients who had just um, recently become an in-house lawyer at one of the insurance companies we represented, she was coming from actually the uh, Attorney General's office for Medicaid fraud, and she said, why does this take so long? Why can't you get this? What's going on? And I had to say, you know, this is because I'm not the government. Um, we have to wait for this, for this information. Well, the next step is uh, what is the provider response when a plan notifies the provider of a, an overpayment? Usually it's not an alleged overpayment. They say, we have determined that you have uh, been overpaid by us X number of thousands of dollars. And what happens when your client gets that letter? Well, there's two types of clients. We're going to have an in-network client and you're going to have an out-of-network client. And the responses are a little different. The in-network client probably has 
a plan representative assigned to them. So usually that's the first step, and hopefully there's been some communication beforehand about the problem. A provider should always be evaluating all the denials that occur from the plan, submitting additional documentation as necessary, resubmitting claims, and working, working the claims. So if there's a surprise, usually it's from an out-of-network provider who might be on the margins. And in that case, uh, you have to have a real discussion about why is the plan taking this position? What's the evidence? Is it because you are uh, having regulatory violations? You're waiving co-insurance or deductibles? Uh, are your people not licensed properly? What's the reason to dig down and submit the information? Uh, so that's the provider response. So moving a little bit more beyond that, where should the audit take place? That's always an issue to look at. So we have had many different types of responses when it gets to the provider level. Are you coming to retrieve my records? What, how long do I have? We typically will say, based on just the way the initial response is, we will know almost how the audit will go. I'm going to need at least three months. No, you will not need three months. That should never take three months. I am going to charge you for all of my time. The plan owes me for all of my time, every photocopy that I make. So we, we, it's interesting to watch just the response. So where should the audit take place? Typically, we would like to see that the audit takes place right there at the provider site if possible so that it helps the integrity of the audit, copying the medical records preventing unnecessary uh, re photocopies and so forth, ensuring confidentiality, you're dealing with HIPAA and so forth. Some audits cannot be conducted on site, and we are able to mitigate that by having providers uh, fax in their records or whatever. Uh, requesting the audit. The request should be at least 21 days before the actual audit is going to be performed. That's just a general best practice. And typically, you want to give the providers at least one month to respond, but sometimes you can give up to three months. We've noticed that the longer the provider has to respond, the longer they will take to send back the record. So it depends on the type of case you're looking at and how quickly you want to move along with the audit. Very important, we already discussed data. It's very important that you have the right people looking at the data. So typically it will be a biostatistician who, who is helping perform the analytics. And then when it comes to reviewing the charts, reviewing the records, doing the actual audit, you do want people who are certified, certified professional coders, CFE. CPC, that that always holds up as being a true subject matter expert. I was going to say also that at this time is when they want to maybe consider resolving these issues um, without litigation. And as, as a lawyer, I've only been involved, with, you know, not, not all the time in those issues, but typically when someone is so, something we call a frequent flyer, someone who is suing quite a bit, someone that, um, you know, knows us, we know them, we can oftentimes sit down and try to resolve it before this litigation. Um, I've had providers actually use me almost as their personal claims person, and they call me up, it's been denied again, can we work this out? And oftentimes you can't. Most times what happens is they get flagged, the providers, uh, they get flagged for a suspected fraud, suspected submission of, of claims that, that have been paid and should not have been paid, and they don't get paid going forward. And that is what will start typically the litigation process. Thanks, Michelle. So the client comes to you and says, we haven't been paid by X plan in you know, over six months, and we've got $1.5 million of, of claims. What do we do? And we say, OK, well, what have you been told as to the reason for the denial? And typically, the story is, well, they first told us this, and we fixed it. Then they told us this, and we fixed it. Then they told us this, and we fixed it. And they kept asking for records, and they kept losing the records, and we submitted the records. And I swear, all these claims should have been paid. And we say, okay, well, what about uh, 
you know, have you been following all the regulatory uh, requirements? Absolutely. Have, do you waive co-insurance? Absolutely not, except in those cases where we do. <laughs> and said, okay, well, do you have a policy on it? Not really. We just, you know, we, we have an ad hoc policy. So we start to say, okay, if you file a lawsuit uh, seeking the money you've already been paid, you have to realize there could be a counterclaim if there are any problems in your operations where they could request money that you have been paid. So let's do an evaluation of, of the pros and minuses of filing a lawsuit. Because the worst thing we want to do as a law firm is get in a position where we file a lawsuit seeking money and we end up paying money for the, the client ends up paying. That is uh, not a good re relationship. So what types of claims are you looking at? So what is the 1.5 million made up of? Is it all commercial? Usually it is. Okay, how much is covered by ERISA? Usually the majority. So you've got non-ERISA limited to your government payers, your government employers, and your religious group uh, employers, although that, that definition is narrowing. So most of your employer-sponsored insurance is going to be governed by ERISA. And providers have a special hurdle to overcome when filing claims under an ERISA plan. Before describing the provider's perspective on ERISA, let me go back to your own individual policies, because I assume most of the people here, unless you're employed by a government or a religious organization, have health insurance through their employer. So if you have a dispute with your employer-sponsored health insurance covered by ERISA, you can't go to state court. Uh, that claim would be preempted, and you would be governed by federal court. All the rest stands for Employment Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. It was passed because the multi-state employers wanted national regulation so that the national employers didn't have to comply with the laws in all 50 states. So it's now federalized. And what they have done since 1974 is they have removed state court jurisdiction. They have uh, eliminated the jury trial. They have eliminated punitive and extra contractual damages. Uh, and basically, they, the remedies are limited to the benefits that are contractually obligated under the ERISA plan. So it's a very narrow ability to recover if you are covered by an ERISA employer-sponsored plan. Providers have an additional hurdle we'll talk about a little later. They have to have an assignment at that standing to sue under uh, ERISA, to have an ERISA cause of action. Now, so, sometimes the providers will have a state court cause of action. They'll say, hey, this is just a breach of contract. I was promised verbally over the phone uh, that I verified the benefits, I verified the coverage, I verified that my facility would get this level of, of pay. Uh, can I sue under a state law cause of action for breach of contract, negligent misrepresentation, and the answer to that is it's going to be difficult. If that was an ERISA plan, then it's likely that the benefits you're trying to get in for your remedy is going to be governed by ERISA. So you've got, as a provider lawyer, a lot of hurdles to overcome. So let's say they decide to sue. They talk to their lawyer, they say, oh no, we did everything right, and they bring a lawsuit. Typically, I mean, there's two different ways. One is providers will not go to a lawyer. They'll just start filing, let's say, 20 small claims actions um, in order to get under the jurisdictional special. So we have 20 small claims actions, and let's say New York City, what do we do? We remove each and every one of them to federal court and consolidate it, and at that point, they might get a lawyer. Typically, they do. Um, and so now we're in federal court, and, and even if it was a regular state court action um, brought by with, with a lawyer, we'll remove it to federal court as well. And then we do, and then because this is a case typically where the provider's been flagged and hasn't gotten paid because the plan believes that they're putting in fraudulent claims or incorrect claims, there's a big counterclaim for all of the claims that were paid before they flagged it. Um, because if they think they shouldn't be paying these claims, that means they think they shouldn't pay the ones they actually did pay. So we have a big counterclaim, and it's not just that individual case. It can be, you know, 
every claim regarding any patient um, this provider has had that we have overpaid because the provider has put in what we believe to be a claim that should not have been paid. So now you're in settled court. Um, and that's where some of the issues arise, too, that we're talking about, about whether do we stay in federal court. Oftentimes, they try to bring it back to state court, claiming providers, claiming that, in fact, this, is an, this was a, a relationship just between the provider and the plan, has nothing to do with ERISA. Sometimes that's successful. Sometimes it's not. It really depends on the state. Um, but the other things that Mike was bringing up as well, which are just technical, really, actually not technical. These are very, very substantive requirements, and the first one is the assignment that he mentioned. Uh, the provider has to have an assignment of benefits, um, which works two ways. Uh, one way is you need it to actually you know, bring a lawsuit to you know, your standing. The second is, if you have one, that means we will argue to the federal court judge that they don't have just a state cause of action because they're arguing they have an assignment. So they, they are bringing a cause of action under the plan. Uh, judges don't like that when they see a complaint saying, I have an assignment, and then in federal court they say, I want to go back to state court because that assignment doesn't mean anything. Michelle, we have more on the assignment. The insurance plans are becoming incredibly sophisticated in every way possible, including the investigators, the experts, and the lawyers that they hire. Some of the top law firms in the country are representing the major plans. And what we have seen is that the lawyers for the plans will fly spec the assignment forms. Now, every hospital has them. I probably sign them uh, whenever a family member goes in the hospital. And the typical language in your hospital admission agreement will say something like, I hereby assign to the hospital my benefits under my insurance plan, something like that. Well, the law in the 11th Circuit is that is insufficient language to give the hospital standing to sue. The assignment is to receive the benefits from the plan. The assignment does not say anything about the right to sue. Right. We have seen some of the top law firms in the country who have prepared these assignments, and it does not allow their client to sue for ERISA plan benefits. That's right. And then, we, and then to top that, a lot, of, a lot of the plans actually have language that say, you can't assign your claim. The reason for that is they don't want the provider to get involved and they want the, you know, the actual patient and it actually, the argument being that it prevents some fraud, you know, you, because the patient himself or herself is submitting the claim and they get the payment. They get to see whether the, the types of uh, treatment that's being argued were, was provided actually was provided. <clears throat> but those are interesting provisions. Um, they are, for the most part, enforced. Uh, the pro provider lacks standing. It's an anti-assignment clause. There are some states that will look at it and say, well, you've been paying this provider for years. You know, you've, you've waived your right to actually claim that you can't, you, you can't um, assign. It depends. You need, it has to be intentional. But those, those are very important cases because assignment is, is you know, it, it confers standing. Do you have anything you know, go to exhaustion next? Sorry. Okay, exhaustion is very important too. And as, as we were talking about, perhaps pre-litigation resolution, um, I thought about, about exhaustion. Um, one of the requirements of ERISA, no matter what kind of plan, a disability plan, life insurance plan, health plan, what, if you deny benefits, you then have to do something called exhausting your administrative remedies, which means you have to say, I, internally, I don't agree. You're appealing the decision. I don't agree with the decision because of this. Here's extra documents. Here's everything I have. You're wrong. This is the reason why. The plan then considers it and oftentimes will reverse its decision. And that's what is a pre-litigation kind of thing. It's a good thing to exhaust because it gives the parties or the people involved an opportunity to look at it and see whether this claim should be paid or it shouldn't be paid um, for various reasons. And it, it's important because once you get to court, it's a very, very strong defense for a plan if you don't exhaust. It gets, it gets dismissed, and I'm going one time, I can think of in particular, where someone sued us, we took this to federal court, um, we counterclaimed for all this overpayment, and then we moved to dismiss the, the claim, complaint against us on exhaustion grounds. It was granted, so that's gone. All that's left is our, our counterclaim. There goes your leverage. Yeah. So 
exhaustion of administrative remedies, what that means to me as the lawyer is the client must have submitted all the evidence to the plan during the internal review process. And there's strong case law, I think, Michelle. Last time I looked at it, if you go to federal court and you want to introduce some new evidence that wasn't presented during the internal review process, the judge is going to exclude that evidence. Is that your? That's, that's what we argue. Um, it doesn't always happen that way. They have some reasons. There might be something. But typically, that is exactly correct. And that's another reason that you should have a well-developed administrative record for both sides. Um, because that's what the judge is going to look at. Uh, you can always, you know, as part of the settlement or resolution, look at additional documents later. But that's all. That's not the law. Um, so exhaustion is important. And there's no reason not to do it. I mean, I, I've seen cases where they've lost because they say, we know what you're going to say. You guys have litigation when you say we're not paying these facility state payments for office based surgical centers. Um, we see this. So we know you're not going to pay us. So it's futile, futile for me to go through this lengthy exhaustion process. That's your argument, judges don't buy it. Oh, now we're talking about mediation arbitration opportunities. Um, again, we've talked about so we've talked about small claims court, we've talked about state court, then going to federal court. You know, these cases can go on and on and on. And what do we all really like to do unless we have a very easy motion and get rid of things immediately or win immediately? People like to resolve cases. Um, a lot of federal courts now have very good uh, settlement um, mechanisms within the court itself, which, which we've utilized. Uh, then there's mediation, going to a formal mediation mediator, which is used quite a bit. And, uh, yeah, this, from the provider standpoint, we like early mediation because healthcare providers are not in the litigation business. Sometimes I think insurance companies are in the litigation business. So usually when you're involved in one of these cases, you get motions to death. I mean, the, the motions to dismiss are usually very strong because of these are risk of preemption issues. And you're spending, you know, tens of thousands of dollars and you, you're not even getting close to a trial. So we like to get as much leverage as possible early on, get to mediation and try to get what we can in a settlement. And, and sometimes uh, it's not what the client wants to get. Yeah, right. It's interesting, we'll be talking about this a little bit later, but we're almost there, that the reason uh, mediations are interesting is that you're not just discussing the numbers. You're not just saying the provider is suing us for $10,000 for unpaid claims and we're counterclaiming for $2 million for overpaid claims. It's beyond that. You get to sit there and really discuss the relationship. Okay. Okay, let's resolve this, but going in the future, we don't want to see you here, and this is talking from a plan, in six months, and we're litigating again and again. So we can take this opportunity in a mediation to try to create a settlement where, you know, I'm going to actually, because we're talking about it, um, some of the creative settlement terms would be, you have to hire a coder. You need to have someone coming in and explaining how to code, and that's something Jean Marie can talk about further too. Sure, absolutely. And then the question becomes, what is a coder? Is it somebody who's been doing medical coding and billing for a while? They really know what it is. Is it a certified professional coder? Can I hire somebody in a different country? Will they be able to validate it for me? Typically, it's a certified professional coder who has many years of experience because you want someone who's not new to the code. The books are huge. It's hard to understand. You want somebody who has a lot of experience. And so that's not something you would get out of a, a litigation. A judge is not going to order that. That's something through a mediation. I mean, there are other, other types of um, agreements, too. Uh, you know, we really, and, and Mike mentioned this, this is the waiver of coinsurance and deductibles, which is really, and, and I know for, you know, like you tell me you support it, too, but in New York it's considered fraud. Because what you're doing is you're representing to the um, plan that you charged the patient $100. But you didn't because you're only charging them $80 because you waived the 20%. So then it goes all the way down, and we argue it's zero. We owe you zero. Um, and that's, and you know, I think there are a few exceptions for, you know, hard cases, things like that. But you're really supposed to collect that. And the argument is that um, it, it's ruining the two-tier system because it's, um, plans want to encourage people to use in-network providers, um, and so they make it a little cheaper, right? You only have to pay a $20 copayment. But if you're having the out-of-network providers waiving all these extra things, deductibles and coinsurance, they're more likely to go to them. 
And so oftentimes these agreements will say, you know, we will, we will always collect coinsurance and deductibles, and we, you can audit us. You know, some, providing like every couple of years you can come in and we will show you, we will show our books that we're doing this. And, and that's important. I, and the case I just thought of too is that a lot of times providers don't know that this is a wrong thing to do. We had a case where this was a flat out fraud lying about services that were never rented, rendered. So that's the big thing. But just in the course of a deposition, and it wasn't myself, it was my, my partner, said, oh, and, and do you collect co-insurance and that Oh, not really. <laughs> okay, another claim. And From the provider's <laughs> perspective in a settlement agreement, you know, obviously you want to get as much money as you can, uh, and usually the insurance companies will pay within 30 days, no problem there. But the general release, the, 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 the plan release is crucial because you're either looking at a counterclaim or you're concerned about a counterclaim. So that release language, they can't go back and see any of the prior money that they paid you is sometimes extremely valuable. So we tell our clients, you know, don't look just at the money we're recovering for you, but look, you are free. Uh, you've got a release for all those other uh, claims that you've submitted. And, and also, um, just so they're not constantly in litigation, um, the type of, you know, often, often the type of claim is just not covered um, under either the plan or the health insurance reimbursement policy. It's just, there, there are many of them. It's just not covered. So stop suing us. And then as part of the resolution, <laughs> resolution of that, they'll agree not to do that and not to bring claims for certain types of, certain types of um, services. Okay. Yeah, and you have the Standard settlement, you're talking about the releases, that's standard, yeah, okay. Yeah. We've seen actually some of our clients move and say, okay, one provider, I found uh, this fraud area, we corrected it, they received education, we'll feel comfortable with that, let's walk them for how they're going to change the patterns and behaviors to another area of potential fraud, waste, and abuse, and they really will stay under the microscope quite a bit. So ways that we perform our audits, the plans look at the audits for the providers, look for two things most of all. So one will be documentation, and I know you've all heard this, if it's not documented, it wasn't done. And then uh, the other area will be if it was even uh, done at all, or necessary, so medical necessity. So upcoding, we, we typically perform many audits around upcoding, and this was hot 10, 15 years ago, evaluation and management, level five, tremendous issue. We started to see the industry correct itself a little bit more, more provider education, providers that aware. Well, all of a sudden it's coming back now with the EMR. So with more electronic medical records, you can see easier ways to get to a higher level. And we've seen a number of our audits where providers are typically going in with level three, level four, where it's not necessary at all. And it, it might be due to documentation or, again, medical necessity. So for the provider side, the best way the provider can help themselves to really understand how their electronic medical record is set up, again, having a certified professional coder, and taking a look at their documentation for completeness and accuracy. And do you have anything in it? No, that's exactly right. Medical necessity is that. And, and as much as upcoding is wrong, downcoding is still wrong. So we noticed that the providers who hire us are going in with level one and level two, when really it's a level four. We'll take a look and we'll say, your documentation, this is really a level four. Well, I don't want to be audited. Well, wrong is wrong. Again, on the fence with CMS, wrong is wrong. And then unbundling. This is another area we look at quite a bit. In addition to upcoding, unbundling. And you'll see this a lot with blood tests where it's multiple bills going in for something that should have been under one. Surgery, too. Surgery. It's yeah. called fragmentation, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. Because it should be a, a, a flat kind of fee for the whole surgery, including everything, and then they'll charge for all the other parts. Mm -hmm. Do a lot with dental. Mm -hmm. Dental. Mm -hmm. All right, and then and what we were talking about earlier, the billing for services not rendered. That's just flat out fraud. That's when we think fraud, 
that's what, that's what we know. And, and it's amazing how much that's really done. Uh, another case that I, and particularly in pain management for some reason, it's just, I don't know if that's just my own anecdotal experience. It's not pain management, it's just anecdotal likely. But uh, I remember we, we, sometimes what they'll do is they'll just copy documents and change the name on top. You know, when it's different, including, you know, results from EKGs and different types of EMGs or those ECGs. You know, those EGG things. <laughs> but, you know, the same thing. And, 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 that's, and that's, you know, straight out fraud. I mean, there's no, no excuse for that. Except, I mean, the excuse is always, you guys aren't paying us enough. But, um, <laughs> Michelle, let, 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 let me ask you a question. Have you seen canned EHR notes? Yeah. You know, where, you know we, we've trained our physicians to use the system, and it's supposed to assist them, and they fill in some blanks, but sometimes the notes look very similar. And how, how are the plans well, reacting to that? I'll give you a quick example. I appreciate seeing when a male goes to visit the gynecologist. Right, there you go. <laughs> I mean, it, sometimes it's legitimate. Sometimes it is the same thing for, you know, I have it, mine can look similar to yours. You know, that's a bit, you know, but sometimes it's just obvious that's not the case. I mean, it's just complete copying. And, and I'm not a trained expert. Tim Marie and her, they're more trained experts. But uh, you got you to gotta just look at it. But that is, that's the big thing. Um, we would always prefer to see an issue with documentation rather than straight on fraud when it comes to, again, treating the patient. We've right. seen such issues where people are having maybe an uh, organ removed that's not necessary. You see children having a lot of oh, dental yeah. work happening because by the time it would go to trial, the child's teeth will already be gone. So we see some issues like that which just breaks our heart rather than, oh, well, the incorrect stuff. <laughs> right. That's, that's, that's right. So it, yeah, that's, that's crazy. Another one that's um, around quite a bit is where actually they bill for non-covered service, but but as a covered service, so it gets paid. And I think I mentioned earlier facility fees. That's a big one. Uh, so, you know, a licensed ambulatory surgical center can bill both for the surgery, the surgeon's bill for the provider's bill for the surgery, and then the facility can bill a facility fee. That's totally covered, not every plan. I mean, you gotta have, the bottom line about ERISA and plans is each plan, you have to look at what's covered and what's not covered. So generally speaking, Let's say license, uh, facility fees paid for a licensed ambulatory surgical center in many plans. What is not paid for, uh, you don't get a facility fee because you are an office-based surgical center. Um, they're accredited; they're not licensed. And so, but they have, but they believe and uh, that it's not an office. They say this is not an office. We're prefer performing the surgery in kind of a very fancy office with very fancy equipment, and you don't have um, a CPT code for it. You don't have it. So they bill, they'll put in um, they'll, they'll put in a claim form and it'll say site of service instead of 11, which is office, they'll say I think 24, 28, which is either an outpatient hospital or an ambulatory surgical center, and it gets paid. The facility fee gets paid. And that is, and then they realize it and they stop paying and then they get sued. And I do want to, I know you want to say something about this. No, no am I good? Okay. But that's it. and I and also I just was recently there's a case situation where somewhat similarly is that some plans you get a high you get paid more or it's, or it's not even capped for treatment related to alcohol abuse but not for substance abuse so they'll put in claims calling it alcohol abuse when in fact it was substance abuse because you get more money too so it's kind of the same thing is that they think they're doing something similar and they feel that they can change it themselves and, and the way you can change it and this is always this is what we argue is you know, you lobby. You get you get the state to change it. You get the state to say that, you know, this is licensed. Or, but you can't make us pay for something that the plan, which is negotiated with the employer, doesn't pay for. I mean, we just can't do it. Yeah. Compliance. Oh, let's see. Oh, I have the ER screen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's the favorite one. The ER, ER screen. Uh, this actually, they in New York, they enacted something called this the surprise law, which helps patients with this. But there was a problem a couple years ago where um, in-network providers would tell their patients to come to the ER and they would bring in their pals who are not providers, not, not, not participating providers, who would bill a lot more. I don't know whether they shared it or what have you, but the bills were very, very high. And 
So they would try to negotiate with health insurers by saying, if you don't pay us this huge difference between what is the RMC or whatever you want to call it, fair health, health we're going to balance bill and sue your, your insurance. And so that was, a, that was a huge issue for quite a while, probably still is when you run into court trying to get a restraining order, restraining them from balance billing. They say to the court, but there's a statute of limitations. We've got to, we've got to sue our patients now. Um, so now in New York, they have, and probably other states, surprise laws where that, the, the patient is protected from that gross overbilling and balance billing. And then there's some negotiation um, that's more of a, not, not in court negotiations with respect to the insurance company. But those are the, the ER, ER scam. Egregious <coughs> billing, I think, is some of the that words. Mike, that will the yeah, balance yeah. billing. <clears throat> so we've covered the anatomy from investigation through litigation and settlement. Now the question is, you know, how do providers prevent these actions? And that's our theme for the day is you've got government risk, you've got whistleblower risk, you've got health plan risk. And the only answer is compliance, which must start from the top, permeate the organization. And you've got to be on it and work the claims in the proper manner. And the best advice I've heard on compliance is the delivery of uh, a problem early is good news. The delivery of a problem late is very bad news. So the compliance folks, need to have those issues percolate up so they can be dealt with in a professional manner and hopefully avoid all these risks. Jean Marie? From a compliance perspective, we've seen providers say, well, that was my coder. I had nothing to do with that. And that's really not okay. We know that you made it to be a physician, you're a doctor, you're smart enough. So that's not an okay enough answer for us. And then we've seen other providers spend a lot of time with their coders and billers and say, well, no, I did more of this. It should be more 99213. Why did you say that? And we like to see that kind of interaction because it is good for the entire life cycle of the patient's record to go from the physician all the way to the bill. One thing that we have uh, discussed with our providers are do not play Medicare Monopoly. So if you got paid for something that was incorrect, you know it's incorrect. Send it back, do it right away. <laughs> you know, you no. basically know, providers know. Things that providers can do, don't wait for an audit, audit yourself. Have, hire an outside firm, it's relatively cheap for this kind of great insurance where you can go out and say, hey, is our compliance plan up to par? Do our records look good? If you were going to audit us on behalf of CMS or a different payer, would we be okay? Yeah. So we would like to move into some questions. I know that those of you who are attending our webinar uh, will uh, be writing in the questions as normal, and Maggie will be allowing us to know what questions we have. But we're going to start with people here in, in the room, if you have any questions. And of course, if we run out of time, please feel free to email your questions, info at advisehealth.com, A-D-V-I-C-E, health.com. Go ahead, please. For those of us who are at the hospital or health system level, are there certain things that you see for somebody um, that perhaps you communicate to hospitals that these are what you should be auditing for on an annual or a Sure. Absolutely. So the question was, from a hospital perspective, are there typical potential schemes, potential issues from a coding billing perspective that plans will look for? Something similar to that? Yes. Okay, good. Do, communicate. Do we communicate then to the hospital? I will say that a number of auditing firms will not even touch the relationship between the hospital and the plan because it has to do with so much of the contractual areas. So that's always an issue right off the bat. Does the contract hold up because it's different for each hospital? Different markets are actually different as well. So up in Boston, if a plan is going to work with the hospitals there, 
what an issue we'd find is, well, this is the best teaching hospitals in the country. We have the best providers. What are you going to say to us about our coding and billing? We have this resource already here. Um, what we've done, we've looked at a lot of ER upcoding, and our plans will educate providers over and over again on, hey, let's look at these particular codes. And you can find that, but again, it really has to do, what we have found is between the plan and the hospital. And it starts with the contract. What have you found? The same, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen um, some case decisions that have uh, named the plaintiff provider uh, for not having an appropriate assignment of benefits. Um, what is an appropriate assignment that will hold up, or is there not one? Uh, the question is, there are some cases where the courts have said that the assignment provided to the provider by the patient is inadequate to uh, give standing to the provider in an ERISA lawsuit. It allows you to assign the payment. You can get paid when the insurer wants to pay, but not necessarily to sue. Right. That's the and, and you can. You, you can draft an appropriate assignment. It's, it's, the assignment would be everything. And, and actually, it would, you would say that the patient is assigning to the provider the benefits, the right to sue, all rights under ERISA, all rights under common law. And then you have a sentence, and that the provider can stand in the shoes of the patient for any and all purposes. And let's get an anti-assignment clause in the uh, end. <laughs> right, well, how, how would you deal with an anti-assignment clause? But you just if there's an anti if there's an anti-assignment clause in the plan, um, it means you can't assign it. It means the only person that can bring a lawsuit is the uh, patient. And then Blue, Blue Cross and get the money and get the money. Blue know. Cross Blue Shield of Florida used to have an anti-assignment, but they paid the providers directly for years. And there are cases now where the courts have held that a plan cannot assert the anti-assignment language if they've been accepting payments uh, or they've been paying the providers directly. That's that's the way that's the waiver argument and it's specific usually to that provider. And you know my, our argument, my argument always is waiver you to show an intentional relinquishment of a known right. And I think that the providers, arguably the uh, courts have found that, have shown an intentional waiver when they keep on paying it. You know. This, um, but I don't always agree with that. The factual thing. <laughs> So if, uh, I think Michelle said that the assignment, uh, assignment the right to receive payment, but not standing to sue, is that because under ERISA, the provider really isn't a fiduciary under the law? No, I don't think it's a fiduciary. It's not a participant. Yeah, it's not, but he's not a participant. Right, not a participant but, plan. right. you need to, the only people can sue are participants. Yeah. So, so the question is, if <laughs> the assignment uh, doesn't give the provider the right to sue. What what is the reason for the court holding that you can't assert ERISA rights? And the reason is because the provider historically is not a participant in the ERISA in right. the ERISA structure. The ERISA participants are the, the plan, the plan administrator, and the patient. Right. The insurer. Yeah. And and the employer. The employer. Yeah, I don't think the employer. No, the employer is right, the, that's, plan. That's the plan. Right. right that's the plan. I haven't seen that. But but it's yeah. an interesting. It's a very interesting issue. I mean, because I, you know, I think I mentioned earlier, sometimes the uh, provider doesn't want to be a participant. The provider doesn't want to be limited to the benefits and all the ERISA. So they want to get out of ERISA. So they'll say, even if there's an assignment, no, we have something different. We talk to someone. We talk up. We have a separate. And those are cases that are you know out there and they're, and they're very factually based. Would those be more appropriate in the state court? They try to argue that. You try to. The, try to, the law in the 11th Circuit is uh, very bad for providers in that respect because you know today when you call a plan, you're going to get a recording that every time says that our verification of coverage or benefits does not guarantee anything. Nothing. And it's difficult to argue then from the provider standpoint that your, your attempt to enforce that conversation is unrelated to the benefits in the plan. And there's a follow-up letter that says the same thing. But they still argue it. You know, people, you know, 
litigation, people argue all different kinds of things. And it depends on the judge. And that's, that's why people like to have mediations or pre-litigation resolutions, because you really the, the, you never know exactly what's going to happen in litigation. <coughs> Thank you. 